Creepiness finally comes back to haunt Uncle Joe Biden, President Trump mulls closing the border, and Democrats demonstrate their lack of knowledge. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. I've been saying for weeks, President Biden, Vice President Biden, that his for his best day will be his first day, and then his worst day will be every day after that. I will provide you the evidence of this contention in just one second. But first, in 2008, the U.S. national debt was $10 trillion. Today, the debt is nearly $22 trillion. It is rising like a hockey stick. If you don't think we are sitting on a house of cards, you are living with your head in the sand. But since you listen to my podcast, you're clearly smarter than the average bear. So what is your plan? Can you afford another hit to your retirement like the last downturn when the S&P dropped 50%? Hedge against inflation, hedge against uncertainty and instability with precious metals. Gold is a safe haven against uncertainty. My savings plan is diversified and yours should be too, at least a little bit. The company I trust with precious metal purchases is Birch Gold Group. And right now, thanks to a little known IRS tax law, you can even move that IRA or eligible 401k into an IRA backed by physical gold and silver. Perfect for people who want to protect their hard earned retirement savings from any future geopolitical uncertainty. If you look back historically, when the bottom falls out of everything else, Gold does tend to safeguard savings. Birch Gold Group has thousands of satisfied customers, countless five-star reviews, an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Contact Birch Gold, get a free information kit on physical precious metals today. See if diversifying into gold and silver makes sense for you. You can go check them out right now at birchgold.com slash Ben or text Ben to 474747. Get that no cost, no obligation kit. Text Ben to 474747 again. That's text my name, Ben, to 474747 for more information. All righty. So Vice President Joe Biden, if you look at the polls right now, the early primary polls, he's leading. He's got close to 30 percent in most of these polls. Bernie Sanders trails him or by up to 10 points. Sometimes it's a little bit closer. But Joe Biden has one kind of serious problem that has now cropped up over the last three days. Can't keep my hands to myself. Yeah, that right there's the problem. So according to one accuser, there's an accuser who has come forward and suggested that she was inappropriately touched and kissed by Joe Biden. Now, that sounds a little bit worse than it is. Here is what she actually has to say. Her name is Lucy Flores. And we have to take her account with a slight grain of salt in the sense that she was seen attending a Beto rally within the last week or two. But she says this. In 2014, I was the 35-year-old Democratic nominee for lieutenant governor of Nevada. This is according to New York Magazine. The landscape wasn't looking good for my party that year. There were no high-profile national races to help boost turnout. And after the top candidate bowed out of the governor's race, none of the above ended up winning the Democratic primary. So when my campaign heard from VP Joe Biden's office that he was looking to help me and other Democrats in the state, I was grateful and flattered. His team offered to bring him to a campaign rally in an effort to help boost voter turnout. We set the date for November 1st, just three days before Election Day. In a state as large but sparsely populated as Nevada, writes Lucy Flores, it takes nonstop travel to connect with all of its residents. I sprayed some dry shampoo in my hair, raced off to Reno Airport, and flew back to Las Vegas. The event proceeded as most political events do, coordinated chaos with random problems that no one can predict. And then Joe Biden showed up. She says, I found my way to the holding room for the speakers, where everyone was chatting, taking photos, and getting ready to speak to the hundreds of voters in the audience. Just before the speeches, we were ushered to the side of the stage where we were lined up by order of introduction. As I was taking deep breaths and preparing myself to make my case to the crowd, I felt two hands on my shoulders. I froze. Why is the vice president of the United States touching me? I felt him get closer to me from behind. He leaned further in and inhaled my hair. I was mortified. I thought to myself, I didn't wash my hair today and the vice president of the United States is smelling it. And also, what in the actual F? Why is the vice president of the United States smelling my hair? He proceeded to plant a big, slow kiss on the back of my head. My brain couldn't process what was happening. I was embarrassed. I was shocked. I was confused. There's a Spanish saying, tragami tierra. It means earth, swallow me whole. I couldn't move and I couldn't say anything. I wanted nothing more than Biden to get away from me. My name was called and I was never happier to get on stage in front of an audience. She says, I had never experienced anything so blatantly inappropriate and unnerving before. Biden was the second most powerful man in the country and arguably one of the most powerful men in the world. He was there to promote me as the right person for the lieutenant governor job. Instead, he made me feel uneasy, gross, and confused. The VP of the United States had just touched me in an intimate way reserved for close friends, family, or romantic partners, and I felt powerless to do anything about it. So why exactly didn't she say anything for years? Well, she says she told a few on her staff what happened immediately. She said she didn't plan on telling anybody else. She said, I didn't have the language or the outlet to talk about what happened. Well, I mean, she was the nominee for lieutenant governor, so that's probably not true. She says, who do you tell? What do you say? Is it enough of a transgression if a man touches and kisses you without consent but doesn't rise to the level of what most people consider sexual assault? 
I did what most women do and moved on with my life and work. Time passed and pictures started to surface of VP Biden getting uncomfortably close with women and young girls. Biden nuzzling the neck of the defense secretary's wife. Biden kissing a senator's wife on the lips. Biden whispering in women's ears. Biden snuggling female constituents. I saw obvious discomfort in the women's faces and Biden, I'm sure, never thought twice about how it made them feel. I knew I couldn't say anything publicly about what those pictures surfaced for me. My anger and my resentment grew. Had I never seen those pictures, I may have been able to give Biden the benefit of the doubt. And she, then she continues and talks about why exactly she didn't do anything. She says, but the problem now is it shows a lack of empathy for the women and young girl whose space he is invading and ignores the power imbalance that exists between Biden and the women he chooses to get cozy with. She says, when I spoke to a male friend who's also a political operative in Biden's orbit, he did what no one else had and made me question myself and wonder if I was doing the right thing. He reminded me that Biden has significant resources and argued points that made me question my memory, even though I've replayed that scene in my mind a thousand times. He reminded me that my credibility would be attacked and that I should be prepared for the type of back and forth that could occur. I'm not suggesting that Biden broke any laws, but the transgressions that society deems minor or doesn't even see as transgressions often feel considerable to the person on the receiving end. That imbalance of power and attention is the whole point and the whole problem. Okay, so here is Biden's accuser suggesting that what she really wants is just for him to acknowledge his wrong, the invasion of her personal space. Now, of course, she knows that if he acknowledges his wrong, then he's basically toast. Because if you acknowledge wrong in this witch hunt environment, then you are finished. Now, we'll discuss whether Joe Biden is, in fact, a creeper or whether he just kind of acts like a creeper in just a second. But here's Lucy Flores on CNN with Jake Tapper. What are you looking for from the vice president here, Vice President Biden? Are you looking for an apology? Are you looking for him to change his behavior? What, what's the end game here? What do you want? Absolutely. I would. Yes, of course, I want him to change his behavior and I want him to acknowledge that it was wrong. And I want this to be a bigger discussion about how there is no accountability structure within our political space. We are not protected in politics. OK, so it is true that there are situations in which men have in public, harassed women, right? This would be the story of Al Franken. Multiple women alleging that Al Franken groped their behinds while he was taking pictures with them. But let's be straight about this. The only actual accusation of truly inappropriate conduct here, or at least conduct that made someone feel bad, is Lucy Flores, right? That's the real case. Now, the reason this is resonating is, of course, because there are plenty of pictures of Joe Biden acting creepy with women. I mean, here's just a little bit of Joe Biden acting creepy with women and young girls. So you can see him, he's kind of nuzzling this, this little girl who happens to be the daughter of a, a sitting senator. And she's kind of pulling away from him because he's getting too close. And then he gives her a kiss on the head. And here's him with another little girl. And he kind of leans forward and whispers into her ear, puts both his hands on her shoulders. another senator's daughter. He's talking to another uh, another woman there, getting kind of cozy. There he is getting cozy with a, a very little girl who, of course, is not his, not his grandkid. And here he is kind of stroking the face of a, of a very small girl who doesn't look supremely comfortable with the whole thing. And there he is kind of putting his hands through a little girl's hair. So he does this all the time. I mean, he's got, like stroking faces. And then, of course, the most famous one is him holding the shoulders and then leaning in and sort of whispering to the wife of Ash Carter on the day that her husband was sworn in as defense secretary. And of course, a lot of people pointed out that, that was weird. But Stephanie Carter, who is that wife and who has been featured in virtually all of these photos, she says, uh, no, this wasn't a thing. So she has a piece today called The Me Too Story That Wasn't Me. She says it happened Two, again, two weeks ago, I was at an industry conference comprom comprised of my female peers. Well, it would be the last time there, as I had announced my intent to start my own company, when a friend ran up to me joyously stating she had seen me. I assumed she was referring to a recent piece in an industry newsletter about my retirement from my firm and transition to entrepreneurship. But she quickly let me know it was, again, that picture which Jimmy Fallon had shown the night before. Last night, I received a text from a friend letting me know that picture was once again all over Twitter in connection to Lucy Flores' personal account of a 2014 encounter with Joe Biden. Let me state up front that I don't know her, but I absolutely support her right to speak her truth, and she should be, like all women, believed. But her story is not mine. The Joe Biden in my picture is a close friend helping someone get through a big day, for which I will always be grateful. So, as sole owner of my story, it is high time I reclaim it from strangers, Twitter, the pundits, and late-night hosts. And she talks about how 
The day that her husband was being sworn in as Secretary of Defense, she was very nervous. There was a point at which she slipped. And then came the time that she was standing there while her husband was, was being sworn in. She says, after the swearing in, as Ash was giving remarks, he leaned in, this would be Biden, to tell me thank you for letting him do this and kept his hands on my shoulder as a means of offering support. But a still shot taken from a video, misleadingly extracted from what was a longer moment between close friends, sent out in a snarky tweet, came to be the lasting image of that day. As I arrived home to my apartment that night, I was starting to get a sense from incoming texts that that picture was picking up steam, says Stephanie Carter, this is Ash Carter's wife. I got on the elevator and must have been too lost in thought to notice someone next to me. As I got off the elevator, the young woman started walking down the hall and began to feel her footsteps pick up close to mine. As I reached my door, I turned around to find her practically on top of me. When I confronted her, she said she was a reporter from the New York Post and did I have a comment about that picture? I quickly went inside and locked the door. She says it didn't stop the next day or the day after that. And she talks about how for years now, people have been basically using this as proof that Biden doesn't know how to respect women. He says, I thought it would all blow over. This is Stephanie Carter. I thought it would all blow over if I didn't dignify it with a response. But clearly that was wishful thinking. I won't pretend this will be the last of that picture, but it will be the last of other people speaking for me. So Stephanie Carter has a very different experience than Lucy Flora. She says, no, you know, Biden is handsy, but he's not even handsy is what she's saying. She's saying that we are just close friends. And Biden himself has put out a statement on all of this. We'll get to that in just one second first. Let's talk about that hair atop your head. Losing your hair stinks. You don't realize how much you care about it until you start losing it, which is why you should be using Keeps, the easiest and most affordable way to keep the hair that you have. These FDA-approved products used to cost so much, but now, thanks to Keeps, they are finally inexpensive and easy to get. For five minutes now, just a buck a day, you're never going to have to worry about hair loss again. Getting started with Keeps is actually really easy. Sign up takes less than five minutes. You just answer a few questions and you snap some photos of your hair. And then a licensed physician will review your information online and recommend the right treatment for you. It's shipped direct to your door every three months. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA hair loss products out there. Some of you have probably tried them before. You've probably never gotten them. For this price, Keeps is only 10 bucks to 35 bucks a month. Plus, now you can get your first month for free. It's a heck of a deal for getting to keep your hair. To receive your first month of treatment for free, go to Keeps.com slash Ben. That is K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Ben. Here's the thing. Once you start losing all of your hair, it's kind of too late. If all your hair is gone, nothing in the world can regrow it. But there are drugs on the market that can prevent you from losing your hair. And that's why you should reach out to Keeps. They will give you a free month of treatment at Keeps.com slash Ben. That's Keeps.com slash Ben. Keeps hair today, hair tomorrow. Go check them out. Right now. Okay, so Joe Biden is responding to this controversy with a statement. He says, In my many years on the campaign trail and in public life, I have offered countless handshakes, hugs, expressions of affection, support, and comfort, Biden said. And not once, never did I believe I acted inappropriately. If it is suggested I did so, I will listen respectfully, but it was never my intention. He said, I may not recall these moments the same way. I may be surprised at what I hear, but we have arrived at an important time when women feel they can and should relate their experiences and men should pay attention, and I will. I will also remain the strongest advocate I can be for the rights of women. And then he talks about how his politics should basically excuse any behavior that women have perceived as wrong. So there is Biden basically understanding that he is a bind. He's in a bind now that he can't get out of because we live in a culture where a woman's accusation of wrongdoing is tantamount to proof that the wrongdoing occurred. Remember, these are the same Democrats who said that Christine Blasey Ford, when it came to Brett Kavanaugh, was innately telling the truth, that all of the other accounts were to be believed as well, until it turned out that they fell apart or were to be ignored. And then they said that Brett Kavanaugh could not sit on the Supreme Court because of all of that. We live in a time when if a woman says that for a subjective reason, she feels as though she was abused in some way, that the man is to blame for the subjective feeling of abuse. Now, I will say that as a personal practitioner of the I don't get close to people without their consent thing, I've always found Joe Biden's behavior creepy. I've never been a big fan of this, but there are people out there who are just huggers. There are people out there who don't understand the limits of personal space. These are the people who are the close talkers, the people who at parties feel like it's good to shake your hand and then hold your hand too long. There are people who are like this. That doesn't mean that they are attempting to harass you. And intent does matter here at least somewhat. Because there's a difference between a sexual assault, which presumably requires a certain level of intent, and I held your hand too long and it was awkward for you, but I didn't even know what the hell was going on. Ignorance, in fact, is somewhat of a defense, at least to the idea that you are a creepy person who deserves to be treated as some sort of moral sinner in this way. So this is not a full defense of Joe Biden, but it is true that Joe Biden's behavior has never really been complained about by anybody except for this one particular woman. Now, if a spate of women come out and they say that he's been randomly coming up to me at parties and then kissing me on the back of the head, I mean, look, that's weird behavior. It's just weird, odd behavior. And again, if somebody came up to my wife 
and put their hands on her shoulders and kissed her on the back of the head the first time they met her, that person may end up knocked to the ground. That's, that's not appropriate behavior. But with that said, Joe Biden, people get accustomed to being treated in a certain way. And Joe Biden apparently has gotten accustomed to being able to get away with this kind of behavior to the point where I'm not sure he even notices it now. Now, I will say that the media coverage of this is very different because Joe Biden is a Democratic frontrunner than it would be were he not. And I will tell you about a Washington Post headline in just a second. So the Washington Post's headline today in the politics section, quote, Joe Biden's affectionate physical style with women comes under scrutiny. Okay. Uh, the, the descriptors there, instead of just Joe Biden's physical style with women comes under scrutiny, affectionate physical style with women, Oh, that's what it is. He's just, that's all he is. The, the Washington Post says this affectionate and sometimes intimate physical style is one of the former vice president's trademarks, a defining feature of the warm and upbeat persona he has built during more than four decades in the national spotlight. Oh, that's the defining feature of the warm and upbeat persona is what it is. It's not just him randomly getting too close to people because he doesn't understand personal boundaries. But the appropriateness of Biden's physical behavior toward women is now being questioned after a female Democratic politician penned a viral internet piece describing an alleged 2014 encounter that left her offended and uncomfortable. Now, here's where the trouble comes in. It is difficult to determine whether people are truly outraged or whether there is just political hay being made while the sun shines. And I'll demonstrate. So Bernie Sanders, who is in a position to hurt Biden here, if he were to come out against Biden, says, listen, I'm not sure that one complaint really discredits Biden. Here's Bernie Sanders on Face the Nation suggesting that, well, this woman should be listened to. Is that really an indicator that Joe Biden is a serious is a serial sexual assaulter in some way? She says she's coming forth now because she thinks it's disqualifying for Joe Biden. Do you think it's disqualifying? Well, I think that's a decision for the vice president to make. I'm not sure that one incident uh, alone disqualifies uh, anybody. But her point is absolutely right. This is an issue not just the Democrats or Republicans. The entire country has got to take seriously. It is not acceptable that when a woman goes to work or is in any kind of environment that she feels anything less than comfortable and safe. OK, now what's hilarious, again, is that the same Democrats who complain about this sort of stuff and say that women need to be feeling safe at the office, something with which I agree, will rip on Mike Pence for saying that he doesn't want to meet alone with women for fear of being uh, of being accused of inappropriate behavior. Dick Durbin says the same thing. He says, listen, one allegation here is not disqualifying for Joe Biden. This is the senator from Illinois. Joe Biden is a friend and a seasoned veteran when it comes to political campaigns. I know nothing about the allegations that I also read this morning as well. I think all of us should take such allegations seriously and with respect. I took the Joe Biden statement uh, to say just that exactly. So, yes, I think he's ready if that's his decision to move forward in this presidential campaign. We have a spirited field of 15 or 16 so candidates this isn't disqualifying. across the spectrum and the Democratic Party and its values. Uh, certainly one allegation is not disqualifying, but it should be taken seriously. OK, so I actually think that Dick Durbin's point here is actually pretty well taken, especially because, as it turns out, Lucy Flores is not exactly a politically uncommitted person, right? Lucy Flores is a fan, apparently, of Beto O'Rourke, and she is, it, it is odd, the timing of all of this. She actually was at a rally for Beto O'Rourke on Saturday. So the, it's, it's hard to take all of this without at least a grain of salt, even if I think that Joe Biden is, is handsy with, with people he should not be handsy with. It, honestly, how many guys do you know who are like this? I, I know people who are like this, older people particularly, who are like this, who, I mean, my, my wife deals with that on a regular basis as a doctor. She's constantly going into rooms with, you know, usually there's a third person there. And sometimes there are older people there, older men particularly, who will act inappropriately. And it's like, okay, well, my wife sort of just gets over it, which is not a suggestion that the men's behavior is okay. But it's possible that Joe Biden doesn't know what he's doing. Now, it's possible Joe Biden does know what he's doing. I don't know. But I will say that I'm not going to take at face value accusations from people like Elizabeth Warren who are in a race with Joe Biden. And Elizabeth Warren, I don't remember caring very deeply about Bill Clinton engaging in behavior significantly worse than any of this. So all I'm saying is skepticism of politicians is warranted. Here's Senator Elizabeth Warren, who's flailing around right now. I mean, she is just flailing. She lost her campaign finance director. She's unable to raise money. She's falling apart at the seams. But she does have one line of attack on Joe Biden, and that is, that she believes this accuser. I read the, the uh, op-ed last night, I believe, Lucy Flores, and Joe Biden needs to give an answer. 
should he not run as a result? That's for Joe Biden to decide. Okay, so Amy Klobuchar saying the same sort of thing. She of the she of the making her aides clean the combs with which she eats her salad. Here's Amy Klobuchar, the senator from Minnesota, also running and also doing the same routine. He's also one who has said in, in, in situations like this that the default is to believe the woman, to believe the accuser. Do you believe Lucy Flores? I have no reason not to believe her, Jonathan. And I think we know from um, campaigns and from politics that people raise issues and they have to address them. And that's what he will have to do with the voters if he gets into the race. Okay, so the only point I'm making here is that I don't know the motivations of the people who are attacking Joe Biden here. Again, I think on an objective level, on an objective level, his behavior with people who are not his wife or child, it's weird to me. It's obviously weird to me. But there's only one complaint so far, and that complaint comes from somebody who happens to be politically motivated against Biden and had nothing to say for five years about this particular incident. So uh, that makes me a little skeptical. Now, it is also possible that the female senators in the race, maybe some of them have experienced stuff like this, and so they have a stronger belief system on this than the men. Maybe there is an actual sex gap here, and men don't understand what women are going through, and so they're more likely to brush off accusations like the one against Biden. But it's hard for me to take at face value complaints from people who are in direct competition with Senator with, with Vice President Biden when it comes to all of this. So I, I will take this more as yet another line of attack against Joe Biden rather than as the Democratic Party suddenly discovering that Joe Biden is weird with women because he's been weird with women for years. Again, we've seen this sort of stuff going on for legitimately. It's been a meme on the right for half a decade that Joe Biden does this sort of stuff. I mean, there are pictures of him at campaign stops with women on his lap. Joe Biden's been doing this for a long time. No complaints. So kind of hard to take seriously the Democratic Party's sudden observation that Joe Biden is actually creepy with women as opposed to they're just trying to knock him out of these primaries. They're just trying to knock him out of these primaries. All righty. So in just a second, we'll get to Democrats who are continuing to flail around for some answers to their own policies. First, let's talk about how you can make your company better. Hiring is challenging. There's one place you can go where hiring is simple fast and smart. It's a place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. That place is ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter sends your jobs to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and then invites them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the very first day. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. Again, they're so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the very first day. There's a reason we use ZipRecruiter ourselves here at Daily Wire to run our business at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire to try it for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Okay, meanwhile, the Democrats continue to demonstrate that they really don't know a lot of things. And leading the charge is, of course, the inimitable Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Over the weekend, she suggested that she wants people to debate her, which is odd since when I actually challenged her to abate. She accused me of catcalling, so there's that. But she had herself a, a very weird episode of Chris Hayes, all in with Chris Hayes on MSNBC, in which she said a bunch of things that make no sense. And yet she continues to be hailed as some sort of thought leader for the Democratic Party, which is pretty amazing since she doesn't have lots of thoughts. But she doubled down on the notion that we are at risk from cow farts. She doubled down on her Green New Deal. Here is AOC, thought leader of the Democratic Party, continuing to push this nonsense. We need to innovate on our technology. You know, right. obviously, like I had a staffer, you know, release a document that talked about cow flatulence, but. Um, which is an issue, I just want to say. Which is an issue. But here's it sounds the thing. ridiculous, but it literally is but an it, issue. But it actually is an issue when it comes to contributing to methane, right. but that doesn't mean you end cows. It means that we need. <laughs> What it means is that we need to innovate and change yes. our our grain, uh, our our cow grain from which you know they feed in, in these troughs. That yep. we need to uh, really take a look at regenerative agriculture. Like these are our solutions. Right. What is regenerative agriculture? Like maybe she, maybe she's just too smart for me. I, I I don't know what the hell she's talking about when she says we have to feed them different grains. Like what Pepto Bismol or what? And it literally says in her Green New Deal frequently asked questions that we have to end cows. So I'm glad that she's running away from that. At least she realizes that was a bad idea. Then she blamed her staff for the rollout of the Green New Deal. She says, oh yeah, that, was my f that, that wasn't my fault. That was my staff's fault. 
It was because they rolled out a draft version of the frequently asked questions. Now, this is just a lie, what you're about to hear, because they rolled out this draft supposedly online. There was no final draft that came after that. Now, normally, there have been cases at Daily Wire where somebody accidentally approves a draft of an article. And you know what we do? We then corrupt, correct and update the article as soon as possible, meaning like within the hour. We're now like two months later, and she still has not released a full frequently asked question. So that was not a draft. That was her final version. And she only realized it was a bad idea after it was released to the public. Nonetheless, here she is blaming her staff for the rollout. You guys issued an FAQ. It had some things that people yeah. thought were ridiculous and radical, yeah, like totally. anyone that was uh, unable or unwilling to work would mm -hmm. be guaranteed a job. Yeah, the yeah. FAQ was withdrawn and said it was preliminary, a draft. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of fight about that. Like, yeah. do, you, do you think you guys rolled it out the right way? Did you well, bring it any on yourself? What I will say is that there, I definitely had a staffer that had a very bad day at work <laughs> and, um, and did release a, a working draft early. So I get that that's what they're seizing on. Um, but really what we need to do is have a serious conversation. Oh, I'm so sick of her calling for a serious conversation when she won't have one with anyone of merit. Chris Hayes just throws her softball after softball and she's like, oh, let's have a serious conversation. Really? What's your serious conversation? Is your serious conversation that everybody who criticizes you is in the pay of nefarious right-wing forces? Is, is your serious conversation that everybody who criticizes you is latently a sexist or a bigot? Is that your serious conversation, AOC? Maybe people who criticize you criticize you because you don't know things, because you say dumb crap on a regular basis. E.g., same interview, she explains that Congress passed an amendment to the Constitution to prevent FDR from being reelected. Let me explain why this is dumb in one second. When our party was boldest, the time of the New, New Deal, the Great Society, the Civil Rights Act, and so on, we had and carried super majorities in the House, in the Senate. We carried the presidency. They had to amend the Constitution of the United States to make sure Roosevelt did not get reelected. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we, you know, there were so many extraordinary things that were happening in that time that were uniting working people. Uh, no. Uh, no. That is just not true. So it is true that Democrats were winning enormous majorities in the middle of the Great Depression because people were blaming Herbert Hoover and the Republicans for all of that. It is also true that Congress was, in fact, regained by Republicans at some point during this period. But it is also true. What is she? Wait, hold up. Just hold up for one second. Is she claiming that the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution was passed to prevent FDR from winning another election? Is that the is that the actual is that the actual contention? Because it was actually ratified. The completed ratification happened in 1951. That was the last state to ratify. That was Alabama, which ratified in 1951. FDR died in 1944. They started the initiation of this process after his death. So how did they pass a constitutional amendment to stop him from serving after he was dead? What? Okay, but it's okay. She knows things, guys. She knows things. The beauty of being a Democrat is that no matter how radical you are, there are always members of the media like Chris Hayes to defend you. You want to see a great example of the media not asking eminently obvious follow-up questions? So Bernie Sanders was asked over the weekend accidentally on Face the Nation an actual question. So he says that he will lower prescription prices. Watch the follow-up. If I am elected president, I'm going to cut prescription drug costs in this country by 50% so that we are not paying any more than other major countries are paying. Maybe How we are you going to do, do that? that? Because we will look at the average costs of prescription drugs in Canada, UK, Germany, Japan, and France. Well, we will look at their average costs, which are 50 percent lower than they are in the United States. And we will do that. And then she says, so your Medicare for all plan is popular. OK, you looking at average costs doesn't actually make the costs go down. But she doesn't ask, OK, so how will that accomplish anything? How will you looking at the average cost of drugs in France and Canada make the drug prices in the United States go down? She doesn't ask that question. Instead, she just goes, so Medicare for all really popular, huh? Very convenient to be. A Democrat. The radicalism of the Democrats was on full display over the weekend. We'll get to a little bit more of that. We will also get to the crisis on our southern border where legitimately thousands and thousands of people are arriving. We just don't have the facilities to handle all of them. First, let's talk about those hideous window treatments that you've got. I'm talking about the blinds in your home. 
Let's be honest, taking the time to pick out and buy blinds, it sounds expensive, kind of boring. Installing them yourself sounds harder than any self-respecting adult wants to admit, but blinds.com makes it really easy for you. You're not sure what you want or even where to start. With blinds.com, you get a free online design consultation. You just send them pictures of your house and they send back custom recommendations from a professional for what will work with your color scheme, furniture, and specific rooms. They will even send you free samples to make sure everything looks as good in person as it does online. Every order gets free shipping. And here's the best part. If you accidentally mismeasure or pick the wrong color, if you make a mistake, blinds.com will remake your blinds for free. They've made it easy for you, so there's no excuse to leave up those mangled blinds that make your place look like a set from the wire. For a limited time, get 20% off everything at blinds.com when you use promo code BEN. That is blinds.com, promo code BEN, for 20% off everything. For wood blinds, cellular shades, roller shades, and more, blinds.com, promo code BEN. Rules and restrictions do apply. I've used blinds.com myself. It is super convenient, super easy, and they are extraordinarily effective. All of their services are great. Go check them out right now at blinds.com. Use promo code BEN to get 20% off everything. Okay, in just a second, we're going to get to the rest of the Democrats plus the crisis on the southern border. And it's April Fool's. So that means we have to let the left teach us biology for a minute. But first, you're going to have to go over to dailywire.com. And for $9.99 a month, you can subscribe to dailywire.com. That means you get the rest of this show live. It means the rest of my show later today live. We've got two more additional hours that come to you every single day. And you get it commercial free on demand when you are a subscriber. That's a lot of material. When you get the annual subscription, you get this. The very greatest in beverage vessels, the leftist tears, hot or cold tumbler. Go take a look at it right now. It's unreal. It's so good. Also, make sure that you go pick up a new copy of my new book, The Right Side of History, the number one New York Times bestseller. It continues to soar on the bestseller charts. Go check that out right now. I think that you will really enjoy it. I think it's a meaningful book all about sort of what Western civilization is and the roots in which it is, it is based. Go check that out right now. There are all, all sorts of goodies, by the way, when you subscribe to Beyond Just My Show. You also get Andrew Clavin's show. You get Michael Moles' show, if that's something you're interested in. You get Matt Walsh's show. He was on our Sunday special. And speaking of the Sunday special, when you subscribe, our Sunday special becomes the Saturday special. You can watch it a day early. Plus, there's additional material behind the paywall you won't get if you simply download the episode every week. So go check out all of those aforementioned glories. Also, check us out at YouTube or iTunes. Please subscribe and leave us a review over there. It always helps us. We're the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. So as they say, one of the benefits of being a Democrat is that the media never ask you very difficult follow-up questions. This also holds true of some of the more intelligent Democratic candidates. I'm speaking, of course, of the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg. He was on MSNBC, and he was asked by Joe Scarborough about his position on abortion. No serious follow-up question for a guy taking the most extreme abortion position you can take. Do you support the late-term uh, abortion legislation that was passed in the New York State Legislature uh, as well as in Virginia? I don't think we need more restrictions right now. I just believe that when a woman is in that situation, uh, and when we're talking about some of those situations covered by that law, extremely difficult, painful, uh, uh, often medically uh, serious situations where the life or health of the mother is at stake, uh, the involvement of a male government official like me is not helpful. Okay, how about when people are just killing people on the street? Is the involvement of a male public official like you viable and useful? Uh, it turns out that in South Bend, by the way, the murder rate went up in 2016 and 2017, according to stats. So there's that. But in any case, the fact that there's no follow up, like, what does that have to do with anything? What does your maleness have to do with that? Why should you be able to abort a baby at 32 weeks just because you happen to be male? That's an OK thing. It's pretty incredible. No wonder Democrats keep doubling down in their bubble. Nobody ever asked them a tough follow up question. And then, of course, you have people like Beto. Beto is just a fortune cookie of a candidate. Unbelievably enough, he continues to ride third in most of the major polls. He, he's, he continues to be at like 12%. So it goes Biden and then Bernie and then Beto. That's all a bunch of white guys at the top whose names start with B. Well, actually, one whose name starts with an R, but we call him Beto. In any case, Beto O'Rourke tweeted out, the unprecedented concentration of wealth, power, and privilege in the United States must be broken apart. Opportunity must be fully shared with all. We must have the opportunity to succeed together as one country. So just to get this straight, Beto O'Rourke is such a doofus that this tweet begins with, 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 we have to destroy all of the unity in the country, and then we can do that as one country. That's the thing. We need unity when we destroy half the people in the country. That's really, really important. We have to destroy all concentration of wealth, power, and privilege in the United States. We have to break all that apart. And then once we do that, then we can be one country. This sort of revolutionary rhetoric on the part of the left continues to be, frankly, kind of frightening. 
And I think it's one of the reasons why President Trump continues to poll evenly with every Democratic candidate who is put up against him, despite the fact that he is personally, in terms of popularity, not particularly popular. Speaking of President Trump, the breaking news on the border is that there is indeed a massive crisis on the southern border because thousands and thousands of people are arriving at that southern border and we've got no resources to deal with them effectively. It's really quite frightening. According to USA Today, under a bridge connecting the U.S. with Mexico, dozens of migrant families cram into a makeshift camp set up by U.S. Customs and Border Protection. The families are there because permanent processing facilities have run out of room. 700 miles east, busload after busload of weary, bedraggled migrants crowd into the Catholic Charities Humanitarian Respite Center in McAllen, Texas. Organizers there are used to handling 200 to 300 migrants a day. Lately, the migrants have been arriving at a clip of around 800 a day, overflowing the respite center and straining city resources. It's staggering, McAllen City Manager Roy Rodriguez says. Really, we've never seen anything like this before. Along the Texas border with Mexico from El Paso to Eagle Pass to the Rio Grande Valley, masses of migrants have been crossing the border in unprecedented numbers, overwhelming federal holding facilities and sending local leaders and volunteers scrambling to deal with the relentless waves of people. Border Patrol officials were on pace in March for more than 100,000 apprehensions and encounters with migrants, the highest monthly tally in over a decade, according to Customs and Border Protection Commissioner Kevin McAleenan. Around 90% of those cross the border between legal ports of entry. So the talk that all the migrants are simply showing up at ports, ports of entry, so there's no need for a wall, obviously that is untrue. And the vast majority of people who are crossing between ports of entry turn themselves into border patrol agents seeking asylum. They try to apply for asylum once they get into border patrol custody. And then because we don't have the resources to actually hold everybody, a huge majority of these people are released into the interior of the United States. President Trump, of course, recently declared a national emergency at the border to secure funding for a proposed wall. On Friday, the president, in a tweet, threatened to close the U.S.-Mexico border if Mexico didn't stop undocumented migrants from coming. But it's unclear what exactly that means. When he says he's going to close the border, I suppose that, that just means that anybody who shows up at a port of entry is going to be turned away, that we simply won't let anybody in. If people show up to Border Patrol, what is Border Patrol going to do? Just re-release them back into the desert? That doesn't seem like that's an actual policy. It, it seems mostly like a slogan. In El Paso, migrant families pressed their faces against the chain link fencing at the makeshift outdoor shelter under the Paso del Norte International Bridge. As they awaited their turn to seek asylum, children covered their mouths with swaths of mylar blankets and peeked through the fencing at passing Border Patrol guards. On Wednesday, more than 850 migrants were released to local shelters, marking a new high for El Paso. And those numbers are expected to continue rising. A lot of this is an expectation of a rough summer, so people are trying to get in as fast as humanly possible before the heat of the summer kicks in. President Trump correctly tweeted out, the Democrats have given us the weakest immigration laws anywhere in the world. Mexico has the strongest, and they make more than 100 billion, years on the, billion a year on the United States. Therefore, Congress must change our weak immigration laws now, and Mexico must stop illegals from entering the United States. Well, the truth is that we have enough immigration laws on the books to deport all these folks, but we don't have the resources to do it because the Democrats refuse the resources. When they talk about the humanitarian crisis on the border, that is a crisis that they have greatly exacerbated by not giving Border Patrol the resources that they need. And President Trump is in the middle of an argument with members of his own government because he has now cut aid to El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras on Saturday. He blasted those countries. He said they were sending migrants to the United States. He threatened to shutter the U.S.-Mexico border, which presumably would also include trade from south of the border. People say that if that were to happen, the supply of avocados in the United States would be gone in three, essentially three weeks, which means that millennials would finally have an excuse to get off their butts and stop playing video games to be upset. A surge of asylum seekers from the three countries have sought to enter the United States across the southern border in recent days, according to Reuters. On Friday, Trump accused the nations of having set up migrant caravans and sent them north. Weirdly enough, his own Secretary of Homeland Security, Christian Nielsen, has been suggesting the opposite, that these countries are actually trying to help us in preventing all of this from happening. The Honduran Foreign Ministry on Saturday called the U.S. policies contradictory, but stressed that its relationship with the United States was solid, close, and positive. Homeland Security Secretary Christian Nielsen says that Border Patrol officials have been overwhelmed by a sharp increase in asylum seekers, many of them children and families who arrive in groups fleeing violence and economic hardship in the so-called Northern Triangle. A border shutdown would disrupt tourism and U.S.-Mexico trade. It's not clear how shutting down ports of entry would deter asylum seekers because they're legally able to request help as soon as they set foot on U.S. soil. So as I say, more of a slogan than an actual policy here. That said, more funding is needed. And by the way, cutting aid to these countries, 
That would be a worthwhile cause if it actually resulted in better governance in those countries, but I'm not sure that that's actually the case either. So this seems mostly like President Trump being incredibly frustrated, rightly so, at the situation on the southern border and lashing out as opposed to an actual coherent policy. Mick Mulvaney, the acting White House chief of staff, is defending President Trump's threat to end assistance to three Central American countries. He said, why are we talking about closing the border? Not to try and undo what's happening, but simply to say, look, we need the people from the ports of entry to go out and patrol in the desert where we don't actually have a wall. So I guess that this is a, a selling point. I, that sounds like a, a sort of backfill justification to me from Mick Mulvaney, the president's chief of staff. Trump's attempt to seal off the border by building a wall, according to the New York Times, and mulling the closure of ports to tamp down on immigration and drug smuggling is at odds with a nagging reality. A nagging reality. Smuggling activity largely comes through ports of entry, according to government data. I mean, that is true, but it is also true that the people are not coming through the ports of entry. He said, President Trump did, I'm not playing games. Mulvaney criticized Jay Johnson, who was the head of the Department of Homeland Security under Obama, for saying in an interview that the situation at the border was truly in crisis. He says, we hate to say we told you so. We need border security. We're going to do the best we can with what exactly we have. The problem is there are no real good solutions absent some sort of change in Central and Latin America overall. The fact is that if we do not actually improve conditions in those southern countries, we are going to have people who are seeking to flee as soon as possible. In an interview with Jake Tapper on CNN's State of the Union, Tapper pointed out to Mulvaney that experts within the president's own administration have said that aid money has helped curb violence and migration from El Salvador. Mulvaney said that that was from career staffers. He said money had not done enough. And uh, that, that does change policy from the Trump administration's own policy. Here's the reality of the situation. We have a bunch of failed states that are south of us, and those failed states are sending people north, not because they are actively sending people north, but because failed states emit refugees. And, not, and these states are, are at least failing. They're, I wouldn't call them failed, but they are failing states. They are failing to limit the violence. They are failing to provide the sort of rights that, that are necessary, and that has externalities. You know, there are only two ways of coping with that, helping to change the situation on the ground in these states, or two, building up our border security so much that we can continue to deport people on a continuing basis just like this. Because if not, then this crisis is going to amount to a lot of people crossing the border illegally and staying in the United States with us out, without us knowing what exactly they're doing here. Pretty amazing. All right. Meanwhile, the, the left on April Fool's Day is trying to play an April Fool's trick on all of us. They're telling us there is no such thing as biological sex. So you'll recall that originally the left's argument with regard to biological sex is that gender and biological sex were two separate things. Gender was feminine or masculine attributes. The left suggested that these were utterly disconnected from actual sex, which is not true, obviously. There are a lot of masculine attributes like physical strength and certain attitudes and how people act in many ways that are different, whether you're a physical male or a physical female. But they say that you can define yourself as more feminine or more masculine, and you have conscious decision-making power over some of that stuff. Or maybe you don't. Maybe gender is just how you quote-unquote identify, but that is something that is driven by some sort of brain software as opposed to the biological, physical hardware of your being. That was their original case. And it wasn't a particularly strong case. It wasn't a particularly sensical case, but at least you could make the case. Now the left is doing something further. Now they are attempting to say that biological sex no longer exists. That biological sex is itself a myth. Teen Vogue has released a video in which they have several intersex people, meaning people who are born with genetic conditions that mean that they have certain secondary sex characteristics of the other sex, even though they are, for example, genetically male. They're, they're using that as an example to say that sex doesn't exist. This is nonsense. It's just silly. It's silly because to suggest that biological conditions somehow negate basic biological dichotomies is silly. It's like saying that if you are born with if you are born with a spinal condition, that this means that spines do not exist. Not the same thing. Here is Teen Vogue trying to push that propaganda point. Hi, I'm Hannah Gabby and I'm here to tell you the binary is bullshit. Gender is about your identity, your expression, and it's often based on ideas about sex. It's important that we really break down what are we talking about when we talk about sex and gender, and is there something called biological sex, and what does that mean? This idea that the body is either male or female is totally wrong, and I am living proof of that. We know intersex people exist and break down this binary. We all have 
characteristics that are typically male and typically female. And it is really about political choices, social factors, ideological choices that we assign meaning to different parts of our body. April Fools, that's a bunch of crap. <laughs> it's a bunch of nonsense. Every mammalian species has biological dichotomy between male and female. It's how the species procreates. To pretend that these things no longer exist because you wish they didn't is really, really silly. But unfortunately, this is becoming a more mainstream view among people on the left, and it is nonsense. For example, there's a piece by a Dr. Michael Reichert in today's New York Times called It's Dangerous to Be a Boy. And then the headline says, they smoke more, fight more, and are far more likely to die young than girls. But their tendency to violence isn't innate. Um, yeah, it is, actually. In fact, in every mammalian species of which we know, the males of the species are more aggressive and fight more because that's what they do. I mean, this is true in all of our of our animal kingdom ancestors. It is true among babies as well. There are real sex differences between males and females. The left's attempt to write out science is pretty astonishing. I mean, it's on the order of, of pretending that vaccinations don't do anything or suggesting or suggesting that aborting a fully grown child is in fact just a cluster of cells. I mean, this is just science denial. It's basic science denial. And yet this is now being pushed by an enormous number of people of the left who suggest that politics ought to override science. I thought that this was the party of science. I was informed by the secular humanist left that what they really wanted was science, not religion. Now, as I argue in my new book, if you actually want science, you have to make certain religious assumptions about the ability of human beings to discover such a thing as objective truth not just evolutionarily beneficial truth, but objective truth. That's a religious assumption. You have to assume that human beings are created with the capacity to reason. You have to assume that when we come to a scientific truth, that it holds for a non-chaotic universe. Right? None of that, those are all faith-based principles. None of those are rooted in pure science. They're assumptions that you have to make. But the left, which has thrown out those assumptions, is then surprised when science caves in on itself. And that's what you're watching in astonishing manner with mainstream outlets pushing absolute scientific nonsense, like there's no such thing as a boy and there's no such thing as a girl because I don't want there to be a boy and I don't want there to be a girl. Totally crazy stuff. Okay, time for some things I like and then some things that I hate. So things that I like today, full points to Chris Rock. So the NAACP Image Awards happened uh, over the weekend. And those Image Awards, one of the nominees was Jussie Smollett, you know, the race crime hoaxer. And there was apparently some sort of moratorium that had been declared on making Jussie Smollett jokes at the NAACP. Then they unleashed Chris Rock on the stage of the NAACP. And Chris Rock wasn't having any of that. They said no Jussie Smollett jokes. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. What a waste of light skin, you know? You know what I could do with that light skin? That curly hair, my career would be out of here. <laughs> Running Hollywood. <laughs> um, yes, no, 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 just. Did, <laughs> what the hell was he thinking? <laughs> from now on, I ain't never gonna know just, you're Jesse from now on. Amazing. <laughs> so Chris Rock taking it straight to the NAACP bosses over there who suggested that he was not supposed to make those sorts of jokes. Good for Chris Rock. Okay, other things that I like. So over the weekend, I have to be, I have to say over the past few nights, I've watched a lot of movies. Why? Because I have to sign a lot of books for folks. I mean, I have like thousands and thousands of book plates I'm supposed to sign. And so that means it's time to watch TV and sign books. Well, there's a, a new movie out at Netflix with Kevin Costner and Woody Harrelson called The Highwaymen about the police officers, the Texas, former Texas Rangers, who took down Bonnie and Clyde. This movie is latently so right-wing, it's, it's really astonishing. Here is a little bit of the preview for The Highwaymen. How many bullets you got in you? 16, I think. It might be good to have a doctor look at you sometime. It might be good to have a doctor look at you sometime. I ain't got no bullets in me. Because I was covering you. You may have heard there was a prison break. It was Bonnie and Klein. Governor, this has to end. So the movie is really good, uh, and it's not at all about Bonnie and Clyde. It demonstrates what sociopaths they were. I mean, they legitimately killed normal people. The, the, the myth of Bonnie and Clyde that was purveyed by Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway 
that they were sort of just dispossessed, misunderstood young people. No, they were actual criminals who were robbing like gas station attendants and killing people who were innocent. It wasn't just them killing police officers, which would be bad enough. And so the movie is about the, the law tracking them down. There are some moments in it that are pretty, pretty great. Go check it out. The Highwaymen with Kevin Costner and, uh, and Woody Harrelson. Harrelson is, is really terrific. I didn't used to like Woody Harrelson very much as an actor, and he's really grown on me. He's really good in this. Okay, time for a couple of things that I hate. Okay, so there's a new movie that is out. It's called Unplanned, and I have seen it. It is very effective. There's one scene right near the beginning that is incredibly effective where they actually show what a what a an abortion looks like. It looks like maybe a 10th or 11th week abortion. And it is deeply unpleasant. But that is the whole point of it. Now, I think that it is really important for people to know what the hell they're talking about when they talk about abortion. I've said for years that the use of euphemistic language with regard to abortion as though it is an anodyne, clean, nothing of a procedure is just nonsense. It is not true. It is the killing of a human being and the killing of an incipient human life. And this movie makes no bones about it. Well, Unplanned has been dominating at the box office. I mean, it did really well. It battles to $6.1 million over the weekend, which is amazing. This is Pure Flix's anti-abortion feature. It wasn't a huge win by major studio standards, but the for, for the indie label, which produced the five to six million budget, it's an achievement because the controversy, uh, the, the, the picture has weathered a lot of controversy. We talked about it on our radio show, actually, with one of the stars of the film. It was rated R by the MPAA, which is amazing because, as Matt Walsh points out, if they were just showing a picture of a gallbladder surgery, uh, the cleaning out of a gallbladder, that wouldn't have been rated R. But everybody knows that an abortion is in a, a violent procedure, and so it was rated R. That is why this happened. It's, a, it's an effective movie because it does show those sorts of things. Twitter apparently banned them, supposedly accidentally unplanned. This is why, I, this is the thing I hate. And then people were trying to follow them and getting automatically unfollowed. Follow again, automatically unfollow because Twitter's algorithm is all screwed up. The reason supposedly that Twitter had banned all of this is because they had frozen their account because they'd been rated R or something. It doesn't make any sense. They've apologized for it. Still, it's bad stuff. Unplanned is doing serious business. Bring your pro-choice friends to see it if you can. Go check it out right now. And apparently, uh, the, the Pure Flix CEO, Michael Scott, he said, we are very happy for the success of the film to bring the story of Abby Johnson, who's a former Planned, Pan, Planned Parenthood clinic director, to audiences and have them show up in such large numbers. Shows how the topic of abortion is so important to bring to audiences. We hope that those on both sides of the debate will see Unplanned. It's going to be hard to get folks on the left to see it. If you can, you should, because it is an important film. It's an, it has an A-plus rating at cinema score right now. And despite being an R-rated film, it distributed just behind God's Not Dead as far as Pure Flix's big budget films. The trailer uh, it has about 1.7 million views. You should go check it out. I'm sure we'll be talking more about it in the very near future. Okay, we will be back here a little bit later today with two additional hours of programming, which is why you should subscribe. In the meantime, go pick up my book, The Right Side of History, which continues to top the bestseller charts. It, we'll either see you here this afternoon or we will see you here tomorrow. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. <laughs> This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. Production assistant, Nick Sheehan. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. Hey everyone, it's Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. Donald Trump says America will never be socialist. We were born free and we'll stay free. The left says not so fast. Who's got the right of it? We'll talk about it on The Andrew Claven Show. I'm Andrew Claven.